Okay, I think we start not after a quarter of an hour, but uh, 10 minutes past five. If we try to start now, just. Uh, thank you very much for coming and attending our next event of the series Hidden Images on Art in China. And I welcome today, or we welcome, Binya and me welcome today to fantastic uh, art historians who have been involved with Chinese contemporary art since more than 20 years, as I know. And both were, have been especially active in the 90s, and, and everybody of them, both are very active now too, but the main activity is they started in the 90s. And uh, Karen Smith is from Beijing, and Marianne Brouwer is from the Netherlands. And one, we, we make a short introduction to both, but we keep it short, uh, so that we are able to, to listen, to have the chance to listen to them uh, for a longer time. I would like to introduce uh, Marianne first. She's an art historian, curator, and writer with specialty in contemporary art. And she was born in the Netherlands and has lived in Japan and in France. In the 70s, she worked as an art critic and journalist. During the 80s and 90s, she has been the curator of sculpture at the Kralomelo Museum in Otolo. And she, there, she curated many major shows and worked with international artists like Dan Flevin, Richard Serra, Franz West, Louis Bourgeois, and Dan Graham. She has widely published and lectured, participated in international juries, and taught at various art institutions. For us, it's very important that she curated a show, a very important show, in 1994. It's called Heart of Darkness, dedicated to issues of exile and the other at the Kralomelo Museum, Otterloh, Netherlands, with specific site installations by Huang Yongping, Chen Zhen, Tsai Go Chiang, Muna Hatung, Gu Wenda, and also other very famous artists, the Sense Moor, and there were altogether 15 artists, I thought, at least. 1997. She curated the first comprehensive exhibition of Chinese conceptual and video art outside China in Breda, Netherlands. It was really a very, very important exhibition and a milestone in Europe after, I think, the 1993 show here in, in Berlin, because we focused on a different thing, and you focused first time on video and performance and installation art. She is currently working on an exhibition and research project about the Dutch curator Hans van Dijk, who also curated the China Avant Garde Show in 1993 in the House of World Culture in Berlin, and who worked in China during the 90s and who had been of the utmost importance to Chinese contemporary art and artists. Thank you very much, Marianne, to be here. I'm happy that we have you here. And <laughs> yeah, hello to everybody. So I say some words to, about Karen Smith. She is a British art historian specialized in contemporary art in China. And um, she studied at the Wimbledon School of Art in London, painting. And after her degree, moved to Asia where she first w um, worked in, in Hong Kong as a managing director of the art magazine Artension. And uh, since 1992, she is living in Beijing, in China, and is deeply involved in Chinese contemporary art. And uh, yeah, she, she is one of the most important Western art critics who promotes and uh, introduce Chinese art into the international art scene. And she has been widely publishing 
articles about uh, Chinese contemporary art in in uh, journals and exhibition catalogs, and also um, she is author of some very important books about Chinese contemporary art and its history. Um, so this is, uh, one, including uh, her book, which actually you can find the books later on the table. So there is um, uh, as one book is as seen. 2011, Notable Artworks by Chinese Artists. And then another very important book, Nine Lives, The Birth of Avant-Garde Art in New China, which examines the career of nine leading artists uh, for the Chinese new art movement that began in 1985, about Wang Guangyi, Geng Xianyi, Fang Li Qun, Wu Xin, and so on, Xu Bing, Zhang Peili, and Huang Tianwei. And she's currently uh, writing a book about uh, the, the art scene in the 90s, um, Bang to Boom Art in China in the 90s. And today we have the chance to get some insights in this field. And Karen Smith curated also many exhibitions in China and abroad. And I just name a few of them. So she curated in Kunstmuseum Wolfsburg in 2004 uh, an exhibition about video art and photography from China. And in Tate Liverpool in 2007, uh, the exhibition The Real Thing. And in uh, Today Art Museum in China, in Beijing in 2009, the exhibition Music to My Eyes. Yes, so I give the work uh, the word to Karen Smith. <laughs> before, before we start, before you start, I would like to uh, just recommend two uh, two events. Uh, I just do it now because in the end it's the end and this is difficult to announce. Uh, on the fifteenth of February and Friday there will be a concert here in the university. Uh, Berlin, uh, with the participation of a Chinese composer, Liu Huan, and I strongly recommend this concert. There are some flyers, when you go out you can take it, it's for free, and it's the first time since several years, I heard uh, 18 years, that a composer student is accompanied by a whole orchestra. So it's very important, and also this piece was uh, recommended for the Toru Takamitsu uh, competition uh, in Japan. So it's, I just recommend it to listen to contemporary music. It's for sure, it will be a very interesting thing to do. And another thing is that we will continue in April, on April 17th, with the public sphere. And I, uh, I really guarantee you a very interesting evening with two Chinese artists, really great Chinese artists, Shi Tan and Zheng Wu, and, uh, the, and with the head of the uh, uh, Ulf Lechner from, the, uh, from, the, from Hamburg. And uh, he, will, um, he will be the, the guest from the, from the Chinese uh, participants. And also, Viviana Tirich will moderate it, and I hope you will also attend this uh, event. Thank you. Okay, so now I guess it's now me. Um, well, I'm sorry to have caused all that uh, problem because Mariana obviously speaks perfect German, so uh, I'm sorry to give you so much trouble, but I'm very happy to be here today and also to see so many people here. Um, it's, uh, it's very nice. Um, I'm not sure how, I know, some amongst you are experts on, on Chinese art, uh, certain periods of, of Chinese art, so you'll forgive me if I seem to be talking um, simply in some terms. If I do then speak about things that you don't know, uh, please ask. Um, today I'm also going to show a lot of images. There was concern when I submitted this uh, image list that uh, I would would, would really not have time to fit them in, but I, I have a lot of images. It's purely just because I think an image says so much, and we're really talking about the art here. 
And one of the things that I do know from being in China all of these years is that for people who are not familiar with China, um, who, you know, so intelligent people who read the newspaper who absorb a certain image of China outside, it's very difficult sometimes to put aside everything that you know or that you think you know to understand what it might be like for a Chinese artist living and working within a particular environment um, to make art, why they make art, and how um, they choose to make the kind of art they make. So what's really important about the 90s, since that's the topic that we're discussing today, and following on from what I assume uh, maybe some of you have heard from talks about the 80s, is that for me, the 90s, the whole core is that it's a history of ideas. Um, there are many, many artworks that were made, uh, and I'm going to show you some that you will know, as if you know anything about Chinese art, are the ones that you remember. Sarah? Yeah, I, I would like to say one thing, because I think this is very important for people who don't know you to understand what you're going to say. I don't know if everybody knows that Karen speaks more or less perfect Chinese. And she's been in contact with most of the artists herself all the time. So what you are going to tell us about them is probably what you've heard from them and not what you conceived okay. about. <laughs> Thank you. I think and that's very important. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I lose my train of thought. Okay. So um, I'm going to show you a lot of what you will have seen. You know, the seminal exhibition that was held here almost 20 years ago um, in, in Berlin, which was really such an important exhibition for kicking off um, what was the European understanding of contemporary Chinese art, which was an exhibition that was so diverse in what it showed. And almost from that point on, it seemed to become more and more narrow. So if you look then, what was seen maybe perhaps in Bonn, uh, three years later, you have a very, very refined kind of view of what was Chinese art. Um, but what was actually happening in China was never just that one image. Uh, it was never just about painting. And what's most difficult to translate about the 90s is that it was just this kind of heaving sea of ideas that would crop up um, as people experimented, as people tried to find out what was artistic creation. Um, people tried to understand what was modern art. And those ideas, in the, in the minute that they happened, had a tremendous impact upon everything that came afterwards because, you know, it's what we say about what, you know, great ideas, they change what happens after. Um, I have a quote from the British artist Jeremy Della who says, art is not what you do, it's what you make happen. Um, and I think from that point of view, a lot happened in the 1990s. Anyway, to go along with the images that will um, give us some food for thought about this. So, this is an image that is very well known from contemporary Chinese art, painted in 1987. Why am I starting with it? Because this is really the origin of the big heads in our... <coughs> Sorry. Um, I need to it's like, in 1997, um, I stood in the, like the basement of uh, the Swiss Embassy with Uli Sieg. Oh, sorry, the computer's turned stuff off now. We are, I keep talking about it's going. Uh, with, with, with Uli Sieg, you know, he began collecting in 1995. And he knew that in order to get a good collection going and to get the artists on board with wanting to be a part of his collection, uh, with what he described as being minimal means when he began, that he really had to collect a lot of work very fast. So between 1995 and 97, he did. And I remember, you know, like there was a first big shipment of works that were going back to Switzerland, and we stood in the basement of the Swiss Embassy looking at these works that were going to be packed up, and almost every single work that we were looking at was a big <coughs> portrait of a big head of some kind, very much rooted in realist painting. We could say that maybe that was his choice, but at the same time, um, it was also indicative of a very, very strong seam of art that had been gone. Um, oh, I'm sorry about this. Because uh, there was a beginning of commercial interest, and this was really beginning to drive what people were doing and making as art. Sorry, totally unprepared, it seems. All the best will in the world to get this right. Now we will start again. And now you'll get my family portraits, my pictures of my dogs coming up. <laughs> you will know more about me. You'll be completely distracted. I'm trying to understand how we get there. We work with technology. 
You see, that's why people prefer painting. It's so much easier, isn't it? You pick it up, put it on the wall. It doesn't turn itself on and off. But one of the important things that you will see from all of these images when they come up is uh, it's really about trying to give an atmosphere. You know, that when we're, I don't know if anybody has been to China recently, and if you've been to China before in the 90s or back in the 80s, but, you know, it's become a kind of a cliche when we talk about the speed of change in China, but boy, is it changing fast. And, you know, it really, it's, it's the kind of change that happens with uh, somehow uh, very often feeling without much, uh, like, real, you know, even though it's a central country, centralized planning, but actually when you see that change unfolding, uh, the randomness, um, is, it seems, you know, a, a very key characteristic. And yet behind that, um, as we will see when we can get these images up, you will see that uh, a lot of the movement that happened within the art um, world was due to changing political policies, particularly to do with things like changing land usage rights. Okay, we're back. One more slight step is just to put. Okay, so we've gone from the uh, the, very, the the first Gingini painting, which was the, the the first, you know, it's the seminal painting of the big head. The the reason that I start with him too is because he's one of the key artists who's really coming up continually with ideas throughout the 1990s. Um, the reason that he painted the big heads in the beginning was because he was trying to find a way to break free of the kind of typical portrait painting that had become so much part of the art that had been the era prior to this new art era, which was, of course, the very politicized era under Mao. He was trying to really get an audience to connect with an emotion. This was something incredibly new at the time, to deal with a personalized emotion. And of course, it sounds very bizarre for us to talk about things like that today, but having emotions, having your own emotions is part of being an individual. If you live in a very strongly collective society where you are basically, uh, you know, a, a just a, supposed to be a very obedient member of society, then you're not required to at least, well, I guess you'd say indulge in your own emotions, but you're not really allowed to, to give in to those emotions in the way that you live your life. Um, this is just following the train of how this sort of big-headed art has evolved through uh, the, the, the period of the 90s and to some of the images that became the most famous styles of art that were being produced. This again is Gingeni. So the first painting was 87, this brings him to 1995. He's still looking at this kind of an image but doing it in a way that's, you know, he's trying to now deconstruct the idea of the portrait. So if we go back to where this kind of image comes from, because the other thing in Chinese art is really that nothing comes from nowhere. Of course, that's an obvious thing with art. Artists or creativity is about responding to things that people have seen. Within the Chinese art world, people had not really had very much chance to see too many original artworks. Um, everybody knew this painting, which was painted in 1980 and was considered to be the first kind of like break away from the propaganda type painting because here was a Mao sized portrait but of a peasant. That was the original Kamau portrait it was supposed to be based on. And again, it went back to this kind of... Sorry, no, I'm stuck. Sorry. This image here, which was again something that really began um, a little bit in the... This is from 1962, where people were using painting um, to look at sort of... Uh, people, but still it's not really about the character, you know, there's a lot of message that goes on in these images. So this comes back to this kind of image, Gunjini again, why is he important in the 80s, in the 90s? Because he starts with these kind of ideas. His work with portraiture here goes down to something which really began this, this kind of way that ideas were beginning to ferment in the early 90s. A lot of the big portraits that you just saw began to look at things about personal identity, one of the things that Gun Jin Yi did and Zhang Pei Li, who we worked very closely with, they were always questioning, and they would be questioning identity, questioning sort of how art would provide messages to people, 
how it could actually work to be a force for change in society. They did a lot of projects which were just about documents and papers that you'll see in a minute. Um, he continued doing work like this, uh, which is working with photography. He would go into a dark room, he would take photographic paper, just sprinkle developer on it. And this particular project was sent off to an exhibition space in Australia so that the paper came straight out of the dark room, went into an envelope, and nobody knew what would the actual photographic paper would look like by the time it arrived in Australia, or when it was hanging on the wall, exposed to light, and that it would actually change throughout the period of the exhibition. Um, that's just a close-up image of what he was doing. This is, again, him using photographs, using portraits to, to check about identity. You know, this is... Uh, taking these images from kind of like every kind of identity that people have um, and noticing that people look different in every single picture that's ever taken of them. So again, questioning the reality of what people look like. This was him using a uh, questionnaire to fortune tellers. Various fortune tellers asked to give a reading of a different personality, um, just that he, well, the same person he described to them. <coughs> So all of these works, and this is him working with again with portraiture, but in the in the dark room. Um, this is him again working with ordinary people, where he would see somebody in the street, uh, photograph them or film them doing a particular action. Very very ordinary people, and then ask them to come into a studio to reperform that action. So as soon as you're asked to do something that you do naturally every day, you become incredibly aware of the awkwardness of something that you would do very naturally. So a lot of these ideas were just about, you know, becoming aware of self. And I think that this is one of the key ideas of what was happening with the 90s, was how to translate individualism into what people were doing as art. Um, this is him much more recently playing a game with photography, ideas of sort of still life. This is using books. You know, this is an artist who never knew what was going to happen when he, he did things, you know, working with a, an aesthetic in a way that had been denied by a lot of other people who were painting. I mean, if you, you see a lot of those uh, very standard kind of political pop, these, these paintings have become no longer about painting. They were just about transferring an image onto a, a, to a canvas in a way. So here he is just working with books, working with what happens. This is him submerging books in pigment or in ink or in uh, watercolour paper, working with marks on paper. Um, this kind of myelograph defect was something that had been used right throughout sort of the, 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 the communist era because it was the easiest way to reproduce images and information to get it out to distribute the kind of socialist message across China. Here, books that were redacted. You know. um, so, of course, this is where it all begins. This is what all of the artists for this generation were heir to. It was this kind of political imagery, and here it was how it was created as a group of people together. Um, and, of course, it leads to this type of imagery. This is the, the sort of images that people became very aware of. Um, this is Wan Jin Song making a parody of, again, that's the original propaganda image. And you see how it gets translated into the sort of art that was being shown <laughs> quite a lot um, as representative of Chinese painting. This, was, this goes back to 19, I'm sure you've seen about this if you've seen anything to do with Chinese art. This goes back to the stars. This is 1980, 1979. This is like the first group of artists who actually kind of stood up and said, art should be about freedom of expression. Um, and this is them on the steps of the, the county hall, uh, the, like the town hall in, in Beijing, marching because when they tried to show their works outside the National Arts, Fine Arts Museum in Beijing, their works were confiscated. Um, and they decided to march. And this is quite a sort of a radical break that from the end of the Mao period, like 1976, 1979, you've already got artists who felt they could stand up for something. Um, here you have them on the way, on their march, you know, this is the uh, call for artistic freedom. And the reason I'm showing this, because it's here, we begin the 90s really, in 1989, with the big exhibition, the first survey that happens of contemporary Chinese art, which takes place in Beijing. Um, and of course, 
this exhibition, you can see a lot of fevered activity, a lot of people kind of, you know, their symbol was the no U-turn sign we saw at the beginning. This is what it looked like inside the museum. In a lot of kind of spontaneous performances, people going along just, uh, you know, wanting to, to, to really show that they were on board with this new creativity. And of course, here you have Xiaolu and uh, Tang Song, uh, who were responsible for firing a gun into this uh, artwork that you can see they're standing in front of in 1989. And this took place almost exactly a year ago. It was February the 9th uh, in, in 1989. And the result of that first survey, which was a tremendous triumph to get into the art school, was that, uh, sorry, into the National Museum, was that then the art was banned from the public arena. So the whole of the 1990s, having just got that first step into the public world in China. The 1990s was really about finding a public space uh, and trying to recover ground that was lost. This was an exhibition that took place in 1999, though, uh, 1991, sorry, that was in the Natural uh, the History Museum, which is on Tiananmen Square, which has now been revised into a very big building. Um, showed very kind of cautious, uh, conservative, uh, realist works. And this was the kind of thing that was being seen within China. The curtains, the reason you see the curtains is because the person who organized it was actually working for the Beijing Youth Daily, uh, which of course is run by the, the, the youth uh, organization, communist youth organization, but was still a you know, fairly important paper. And because you have an artist who works in the newspaper, actually he managed to do a tremendous amount. Um, so here you get the start of these ideas that begin to get spread. And one of the ideas that I just mentioned is finding public space artists were forced to go and take uh, you know, exhibitions where they could in the 1990s. Um, this, this is a, a very liberating part of what happened with the art in one way because it really got out to people. This is in the campus of Beidar and Renmin University, the artists who were just showing on the campus. Um, and I like to show this to museums when, we, when I do talks because this is, you know, obviously transportation is a very important issue for museums. This is the way things were obviously transported. This is 1992. This is 1992, where the artists in June, you know, actually commemorating June 4th, were showing in a, in a public park. Um, and again, you know, you see some of those paintings that then became like, you know, the figureheads of the 1990s that were being shown in a public space. So for the most part, that was one aspect of what people were trying to do. These kind of images where you see artists in studios um, was a whole new phenomenon. I mentioned at the beginning about people being able to have a studio. What we forget when we think about how art was made in the 90s was that even having a space, you know, in the 1980s, almost nobody had what could be called a studio. People made very small works in the very small places that they lived in. And suddenly in the 1990s, you have, like, this is Fang Jun's studio that was built in Songzhuang on the east of Beijing, uh, Liu Wei here. You get these very, very uh, expansive, you know, studios that are being built, um, partly because of the change of regulation for land use, which allows individual people for the first time to be, to be able to rent spaces. And so all of these are tremendously important for changing the ideas of how a person can exist and how an artist can make art. This was the entrance to the Beijing's East Village, which is just behind where the Great Wall Hotel is. Um, and you can just get an idea from that, you know, what it was like. Of course, this became a very important movement in the mid-90s, uh, was performance art. And again, it was very much a response to the fact that a lot of the art was, you know, so-called underground. But I always try to kind of think that underground should not be understood entirely in terms that we understand. We, we use underground in, in, in Western sort of speak because there never previously had been a public space for contemporary or modern art in China. In fact, you know, from the even pre-communist era, you know, the, the culture of showing art was not in a public space in a museum. It was amongst scholars and amongst people who would consider themselves cultivated enough to share artworks. So this was a very much brand new sort of culture that was happening everywhere. And here you have an artist, Huang Rei, who was also one, a, a member of the stars originally. Um, this was, you know, a, a period of time when Beijing was under mass demolition. An artist would go out into kind of the hutongs into the areas where the city was being demolished and actually create works on site. Um, this is a, this is Wang Jianwei, who's one of the most important thinkers 
for the for the 1990s, who made a very clear break away uh, with art. Oh, oh, I'll see in a minute. Um, with with using sort of objects rather than using anything conventional. Even when I arrived in in 92 and right through till very you know relatively recently, it because of the way arts taught, it was painting, sculpture, or printmaking, you know, mural painting, not even ink painting until sort of a little bit later. People were very much hemmed in and bounded by these, you know, medium that they used. So to have an artist like Wan Jin Wei, who came from being a soldier, left the army, went to Hangzhou to, to study art, and then ended up doing community projects like this, where he worked uh, in Sichuan with a farmer contracting the agricultural land to grow a particular strain of barley. Um, this was very new. You have people using the Great Wall of Art, the uh, Great Wall to, to, to cover again, the guy who worked for the Beijing Youth Daily. Um, Wang Jin, who was taking bricks from the Forbidden City, uh, tapping into this you know, consumerism that was beginning to feed China. Um, other artists who were just using the natural environment. Um, and also you have this, this kind of thing came from the, the beginning of a really firm engagement with foreign people who were coming into to, uh, Beijing. And this was, you know, beginning with obviously exhibitions that were happening like the one in uh, Berlin, um, but also because there were people who were living in Beijing, maybe in the diplomatic compounds, who were showing art in these spaces. And they became very important places where exchange was taking place. Also in apartments, this is the apartment of an artist called Zhu Jin Shi, who I think has been, well, he's been living in Berlin since 1985. Um, and again, this has become one of the really interesting aspects of what was happening in the 90s, was people who traveled abroad, who lived abroad, who were bringing back ideas. And I think why I keep talking about ideas is it's very hard to give visual force to ideas and how ideas moved between people, whether it took place between discussion um, it's really not, a lot of what was developing was not from artists having the opportunity to stand in front of works of contemporary art, either of other Chinese artists or of foreign artists. There were very few exhibitions that were taking place in the 1990s, partly as a result of what happened in 89. There wasn't a lot of exchange coming in to China, whereas in, at least in the 80s there had been some big exhibitions. Um, People like Zhu Xinxiu who lived in Berlin um, had a very different attitude towards what could be done. And they would use like their apartment spaces and give it over to artists. This is a series of exhibitions that uh, were done, was done in his, this is a song, sorry, song Dong work, um, that were done in his apartment. And again, it became a, it was a tiny place. I mean, you know, I, I don't know if the images give an idea of really how small these rooms were. It's a very typical kind of, uh, Two, two rooms Chinese apartment, but a lot was being done in it. This is Wang Gongxin, uh, another Chinese artist who'd been living in New York, came, coming back, you know, there was a big kind of wave of artists coming back to, to uh, Beijing, uh, coming back to China from like 93, 94, and all finding ways to kind of uh, contribute to what was happening. This was their private home in Beijing. Um, it was also in a hutong, and it really became a gathering place for so many of the discussions about art that were taking place in the uh, in the 90s, and this was, you know, another. This is a great example of how uh, people were able to use a platform. This is the Beijing Youth Daily newspaper, which has a pretty significant circulation, and under the auspices of this kind of, uh, you know, in in 1991, where you had like the fall of the Soviet Union. And in 92, Deng Xiaoping goes on this sudden tour. One of the big reasons for really wanting to push forward with the reform in 92 was really beginning to see what was happening in the Soviet Union um, as it disintegrated, basically. And the economy was really, you know, having a, a big struggle. China knew that if they were going to change, they couldn't possibly allow society to disintegrate in the way it had in the Soviet Union, because it would just lead to chaos. So this real push for the economy and the, the, the big drive happened in 92. So you have a, this is when you get sort of the beginning of private home ownership in China. 
And so this, this idea uh, was very clever in the Beijing Youth Daily because under the auspices of this new idea that you could own your own place, that so you could decorate your own home, they gave to all these artists, come up with a conceptual project about what you would do in your own home. Um, and of course what's really interesting is how many of these images relate to control and surveillance. But partly because sometimes in China the odd thing is that if you give something a nice sounding name, it gets past the censors, you know. So this went out uh, over the whole of the year for 1994. And it brought together a group of artists working in uh, different ways who then realized that actually publishing was a really good way of disseminating ideas. Uh, this is the Xin Ke Du, which is the good, an artist called Gu De Xin, uh, Wang Lu Yan, and Chen Xiaoping, working in very interesting ways. The reason I'm showing you this is because when you compare with the images you saw in the beginning, these kind of paintings, which are really visually attractive, you can understand what a hard struggle a lot of the artists working with ideas had in the 1990s. Because for a lot of the visiting curators, a lot of people coming to engage with Chinese art, you know, it, it, there, there was nothing that resonated when they looked at a lot of the work that was being made by Chinese artists. You know, they, it, it didn't look Chinese, obviously, but also it just, you know, how you would have to take that back to Europe or to, to somewhere and put it into a context that an audience could understand. This is a Wang Jianwei work from 1992, and it's really one of the first sort of, um, it's about scientific systems, and it was really based on this Chinese idea of, uh, uh, a, there was an economic treatise that was published in 1991, and he tried to give it kind of, kind of a visual uh, reference. And it's still, this comes back, this is Gen Jianyi again, working with forms of documents from 1988. And so, you know, and this is for another document work he was doing from 94. Um, this kind of publishing uh, projects came together in projects like this, which Gen Jianyi organized, which was called, like, November 26 as a reason. So there was really kind of as a way to break out of what people were doing and what people were beginning to assume was Chinese art. They were coming up with all kinds of like creative ways to bring different groups of people together. So this was a guy who was like, you know, turning his apartment into a complete surveillance system. Everywhere you moved in the apartment, you would be recorded and monitored. Um, you can see him there. This is Zhang Wang, who was, this is, because this project was done in 95. So this is him cleaning up the ruins. You know, a lot of Beijing, as I just said, with uh, Huang Rei, you saw him blowing up the, the uh, in the hutong with the bottles. You know, these kind of things were really about just commenting on society. And I think they had tremendous importance um, because of that. This is another project that, uh, again. And there were also small spaces beginning to open. This is Xu Bing from 1994, working with these pigs. So, you know, a lot of things that were really interesting were happening. Um, this is a, a, a space called Hanmore, which was just behind the Beijing Hotel, just off of uh, Tiananmen Square. And it really was a great space for, for shows um, for a period of time. This is another uh, very interesting space. This was in Shanghai. Uh, this was in the ruins, ruins of the uh, original of the Academy of Fine Arts, it was in Wafujing. And this was like on the final days, the, the artists went into the old studios and just, you know, transformed them with the materials that were there. This is another work by um, Wang Jianwei. And this is from another space. This was the, uh, the Capital Normal University. And there's a very funny story about, you know, they had an exhibition space, which was a typical, every university had its meeting hall and its exhibition space where, you know, obviously during Mao's time, they would have shown all the proper kind of uh, propaganda works. And it had not been used for a long time. And there was a, a like a friendship exhibition that was being done between Germany, sorry, between uh, Japan, Korea, and China that was in 1994. And partly because there was a will to be friends with other Asian countries, they had some support, but no museum would take this in, in Beijing. So basically, Song Dong persuaded the, uh, because he was a student of this school, persuaded them that they could use their meeting hall. And uh, they said, but it's not a proper museum because one of the requirements from the Japanese and the Korean was that it had to be in a museum. So they just went somewhere, got somebody to carve a sign that said museum, stuck it on the door and said, there you could do a museum. And for a while, 
until the authorities kind of decided that this was really not quite right. Um, this was a very important space, and this uh, Andreas knows very well, because in 95 he also bought uh, a group of artists there. And this again is Judin Shi, who did a wonderful piece there. It was a maze, made out, made out of uh, paper. It was a beautiful piece. Uh, this is Yin Shujin, who did a, a, a piece there. It was a tremendous uh, you know, freedom in using these kind of spaces that were kind of a little bit like below the radar. <coughs> But people were also going outside. There were a lot of projects that were being done in the streets. This is Song Dong again. This is why I put this in here because this is one of my favorite projects. There's a lot of artists who, because they were really great with ideas, um, you don't necessarily hear about them anymore. This is Wang Pong, uh, and this is the entrance to the, it says the Contemporary Art Museum, which is actually, again, was once the exhibition space belonging to the school affiliated with Central Academy. And his exhibition work was to go and brick up the entrance. Um, which of course caused consternation uh, amongst the, uh, the, the uh, authorities at the school. But, you know, this was really, uh, so, so much of this just doesn't get translated because um, it's, you know, it's not easy to explain what these things were uh, outside of China. They rely so much on context. And this is one Pan again in the uh, a pavilion at the Forbidden City, which was going to be refurbished. So before it was refurbished, he spent days photographing it. And then after it was finished, he went back to live there again and put the photographs there. And again, it became a site over a period of five days, became a great site for people discussing because this really coincided with so much of the destruction of the hutongs in Beijing um, and really was the beginning of this kind of wave of nostalgia that still seems to be waving over the city. You know. This was down in Sichuan, one of the early projects that was done about uh, environmental awareness. Um, uh, from a really dirty river, taking the water. It was called washing the water. Sichuan province, Sichuan. Just to, to, to tell the name of the artist. Oh, Yin <laughs> I'm sorry, 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 yes. And this is also Wang Pong. There's a number of artists uh, who were involved in this, working with the water. May I ask a question? Yes. Uh, now, six or seven slides ago, it was, yes, ice. Yes, yes. it's no. ice. Yes, Thank it's you. ice, sorry, yes. It's ice from the river behind, that you can see behind, yeah. And so they got local people to come along with buckets and to wash it, yeah. And this was like creating a rain in a pavilion. Um, and, you know, at this period of time, this is in Lhasa. So the first year they did this project in, uh, in Sichuan, and the second year they took it to Lhasa. Um, this is another ice project that was done in Zhengzhou, and uh, this was where they, they, uh, they, they got <coughs> ice blocks, and inside the ice blocks were all of these products. This is in 19, uh, 1996, it was done in Zhengzhou for the opening of a, a, a shopping plaza, and so all of the people could go and get the products out of the ice if they can hack it open, and it was a mob scene, you know, you can see it. Yeah, it was quite something. So there are, this is another space, uh, and the reason I mentioned this space uh, is because here you start to have the academies start to allow uh, exhibitions to take place. This is the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing. They, the first really interesting series of exhibitions they did was uh, this sculpture for the uh, sculptors who were professors at the academy. But it was the first time that you had what was called an installation that was allowed to be shown in a public space. Because ever since the exhibition in 89, that uh, was back at the beginning of uh, this talk, um, things like performance and installation were very explicitly banned from um, the, the public arena. And this is in Hangzhou, uh, where they did the first video show, which was in 1996. Um, and then this is really uh, like the first uh, real conceptual art show that happened in uh, China, which took place in 1996 in um, Shanghai, mm -hmm. and it's in the Liu Haishu Art Museum. Um, and the Liu Haishu was a very important modernist painter in China. Um, and sometimes, you know, where you have these museums that were given to these very venerated uh, elder kind of painters, they were a little bit uh, more flexible than some of the other spaces. Um, so it was quite an interesting exhibition. Uh, this was actually by Cho Jie, who I think uh, was here earlier speaking, yeah. Um, 
So you see a lot of kind of materials, a lot of sort of experimental um, works that rely a lot on context. Uh, one of the interesting things that still today about some of the most interesting works that I see, some of the most political, some of the most challenging works, is that they don't really translate so easily. Um, and here, because we come to 1996, kind of, you know, this is by now the kind of image that's being cemented everywhere of what is political art. And again, to come back to this idea that it's so much more colorful and it's so much more <coughs> easy for people to read. Not you can see, sorry? Not that confused. Oh, sorry. Yeah. sorry. This uh, And this actually, I put this here because this is an image by a very, very famous, brilliant artist called Wang Xingwei, um, who was really making this kind of uh, little bit of a joke about where art was going um, in, in the, in, you know, in terms of international profile. And he makes this, it's actually Li Xianting, the critic, who's driving the tractor. Yeah. Um, but this brings us back to kind of like, you know, what was really now becoming a force in China. And uh, just to mention again, Hans van Dijk, uh, because by now we just saw the Central Academy of Fine Arts had a gallery, uh, and Hans worked for two or three years with this gallery, um, and he did some really interesting exhibitions. Um, this is just, I put this here because it has this great uh, title, that's by Wang Xingwei, um, the artist who just did the painting of the tractor. And this was, uh, Hans did one of these, you know, series of exhibitions, but one of the most memorable for me, at least, was John Tia Hai, uh, who was a very interesting artist. And at the time that these ideas were going around, and he was really watching between the struggle that people were having to develop their own identity as artists within China and within a Chinese cultural context and with relation to Chinese uh, maybe the socio-political situation, maybe the cultural heritage, um, but at the same time feeling very much under pressure to catch up with the West, to look like what was happening in the West. Um, uh, but also <coughs> feeling that the West was choosing too much art that seemed to look like Chinese art, that for most Chinese artists wasn't very Chinese at all. Um, so what, uh, this Jyoti Ahai was in the middle and really kind of making a little bit of a joke about the sort of the tremendous pressure and sort of, you know, the, 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 the mood amongst artists that was happening at this time. But also a little bit looking at what was happening in China too, this idea that uh, things were moving very fast, things were becoming very fashionable. Um, and I put this in here because uh, this w was one of the most uh, uh, poignant works at that moment because everybody was beginning to have an awareness of art market um, this is 1997, and uh, somebody, you know, asked him what would be the price of his artwork, and he said he didn't know, but, you know, it would be valuable enough to have Louis Vuitton would make a sack, you know, a bag just for his uh, his work. And he did this, you know, he did this wonderful series of, uh, again, coming back to this idea that print media was a very useful way of disseminating ideas. He made a play. Um, with these kind of uh, fake magazine covers that would always have something related to what was going on at a particular moment. This is also another artist that Hans did a great show for. This is Hong Hao, and I put this in here because, again, coming back to media, this is a series of uh, images that he did from a book. It's like the compendium of uh, contemporary Chinese culture as he saw it. It's an encyclopedia of what was happening, and it's a tremendous satire upon what was becoming consumerism, what was becoming patriotism, um, all kinds of ideas that uh, were clashing at that particular moment in time. And this is a series of um, like silk screen and litho prints that took him a period of like six or seven years to complete. It's a book. Um, this, this comes back to another uh, Point. I can actually stop here because uh, we're now coming up to the point at which you know we're talking about reality. Uh, I, I just put this in here because uh, it illustrates a final point just to give this kind of context. This is Yen Lei who did an exhibition in 1995 um, and was again looking at what was happening in Chinese society. It was a very important exhibition I feel um, because it was uh, in, a, in an independent space. It was the first time for a solo show, which was a big deal. Um, and he had this photograph in there, which, you know, he was 
talking about that you know there was a certain violence that was appearing in society that hadn't been remarked before. And his exhibition was totally condemned because people said that actually this wasn't real, it was just makeup. Um, and so that it spr sprung this whole debate about reality and fiction, uh, which I think is just a point I wanted to kind of end on because um, obviously this is another work that was done by Xu Zhen, who is a very kind of important maverick artist who made a point to make it real. The first is, uh, this is actually kind of like a video work and you hear the slap, you don't see it, but the person's back ends up being slapped like that. Um, it's partly because of this kind of uh, way that art has evolved, the way that sort of a lot of people look at society and look at history, which I think is what we're sort of talking about here, is that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of room for invention. Um, I don't really know how to express it in a better way than, than sort of <coughs> there's, a, there's a, a rift between what is real in terms of factual history and factual kind of observation of life and the way that people write even about art um, and, and their own careers. And this is going to be one of the, uh, it's, it's kind of, it, it begins in the 90s to become an issue. Uh, certainly for future historians of Chinese art looking back and trying to research back at the 90s, picking through the truth and the kind of, you know, the embellishment and the fabrication will be a real challenge. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karen. We will come back to you in the discussion, for sure. So, Mariana, it's your turn. Karen, I can't wait until that book appears. <laughs> It's such a, it's so great to see all these works again. Um, many of many I didn't know, right. but um, some of course I do know. And um, they so much, I didn't know what you were really going to do, but this is so much like the, um, 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 confirmation, affirmation of what I saw when I came to China. And in contrast to Karen, I've never lived in China. I don't speak Chinese. I've been the passage from 1986 on, more or less. Um, and, um, and I've worked with, with other Chinese artists who were living in the West. But I've never, ever been part of this great art scene. But when I arrived in, um, um, in uh, in China in 1996, um, it was sort of immediately clear that here was something going on that was absolutely unique. So I titled my lecture, Reconfiguring Art in China, Why Chinese Artists Stopped Painting. Um, actually, it may sound like a bit of a provocative title, but it is a fact that at a pivotal moment in time in Chinese art, between 1987 and 1994, many Chinese artists gave up painting. Not that they stopped painting in the literal sense, though many of them did that as well. But they started to take the very notion of what Chinese art was apart. They shredded its parameters, they tore it to pieces, they deconstructed it, and then started to put it together again. Socialist realism had already been kind of discredited in the late 70s by the star group and so on. Now it had, now it had been the turn of ink painting and calligraphy as well. In 87 there was a treatise that appeared in Nanjing which uh, declared the end of uh, Chinese ink painting or brush painting, if you will. Now, it was very hotly debated. There were debates going on all over China about what, what this new art and what this new freedom of expression was going to be or had to be. Starting from the mid-'80s, Chinese art had become conceptual art, action art, political painting, idea art, and more, an art which made use of Western art idioms but had recreated or reinvented them from scratch to suit its <coughs> own necessities and traditions. This art was unmistakably Chinese, but unlike anything seen before. The end of painting and the arrival of conceptual video and installation art 
was the issue I felt I needed to address with my show Another Long March, 1997, because it seemed such an obvious question to me and crucial to the understanding of contemporary Chinese art, including painting. And that show really was very much inspired, Andreas, by the, um, um, by the China avant-garde show, because you and Hans had chosen installations and um, all sorts of works that people had really never seen coming out of China, which were totally new. So that was, that was the first idea I had, that something was going on. Um, apart from the artists who came out of China, who went, who left China, but this was the first uh, inkling one had. Um, so strangely, um, at, the, at the moment in time when this, this idea art or conceptual art or installation art, video art became known in the West, many Western art critics expressed their disappointment since video art in particular used Western technology Never mind that it, all the equipment was Sony, just Japanese, you know, but they said it's Western technology. It was viewed for that reason alone as relatively uninteresting, and like installation art, it was felt to be mainly an imitation of Western art. What they really wanted to see was dissident art. At the press opening of Another Long March, the first question the journalists put to the uh, collective artists who were lined up, there were 19 of them, in front of the exhibition buildings was, what is your reaction to what happened in Tiananmen Square? Um, there was a long silence. And finally, Zoti Hai, whose work you have seen just now, stepped forward and said, and said, gave the only possible answer, and said, shall we look at the works? Because that was their reaction, their answer to what happened on Tiananmen Square. But of course, you couldn't talk about it. The next day, we had, we had suits coming from the Chinese embassy the day after the opening. They were photographing not the works, but the texts, the accompanying texts, to see whether there was anything political in it. And the year before, actually, uh, in Germany, there was a big problem because there had been demonstrations in front of the Bonn show, 1996 uh, Chinese show, and uh, about human rights and the, um, the Chinese government threatened to close the Goethe Institute in Beijing. So even as far as 96, these things were still happening. And you could never be quite sure um, how people would react, how the Chinese government was going to react. So we couldn't put uh, the Chinese artist in jeopardy and say, oh, this is such dissident art. You know, so there is this kind of very strange, naive idea in the West about what dissident art actually is. And I felt that this has been an enormous hindrance um, to, it is, it's almost voyeuristic. You know, you look, at, you look at the East and you think, oh, these poor people, and they are all dissidents, and the art has to be good. And it's not like that. It's, it's like people try to circumvent censorship. They try things. They, do, they, they put all their, their intelligence and their minds and their independence and their humor as well into... Um, creating something that sidesteps this whole thing. But um, anyway, um, so, so how I have a few slides here actually, which I show you. Um, so, so just to give you an idea, maybe, I mean, probably everybody knows, but uh, these are some kind of touristy uh, slides from, um, from the 60s and uh, the changes in, I don't know. Yeah. Which one do I? Yes. Yes. Ah, I need one. This is the, the building of the A1 in, uh, in Shanghai, uh, which went from uh, the, the new airport, which was then Hongzhou. And this is kind of ubiquitous in Asia. I mean, this was, this was in the 60s in, in Japan. It was the same thing. They were building these huge highways all through the cities. <coughs> uh, but this is Shanghai 96. Farmers streamed into um, into Beijing and, and Shanghai doubled in size in um, in the in the in the mid mid nineties because all these impoverished farmers came by the millions to find work in big cities in, in construction really. Um, oh sorry. 
This is one of the Shanghai Hutongs. I, th I thought maybe it was even Denis Studio. This is another a very nice one in, in, in Beijing. So this is the old way of life. This is um, a building that had just been completed, a business center, where people are washing the windows. Um, you know, it was this very, it's like, this was very, very high up. But they were, this, is, this is the destruction of, of the center of Shanghai. And this was, actually that's a work by a Mongolian artist, but this is how it looked when it was more or less completed. Okay, this is the next slide. And um, this is a, a thing called Washing a Chicken um, by Dampeli. But I'm not there yet. Um, so, the, and then one of the most important things that happened was of course the formation of a new middle class and this in China and the things that um, I, I always have a feeling that there's this huge um, gap between the horrors that happened in the 70s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and then suddenly everybody um, gets this gilded kind of life, or uh, that is as if everything has to be forgotten about that. Um, at the outset of the 90s in China, as Karen has also said, there was no infrastructure in, in contemporary or modern art at all. No galleries, no curators, no museums, no collectors, no mobile phones even, or internet. One artist told me that as late as 1997, the crates of artworks shipped in from the West were better crafted and more expensive than the furniture in his own home. And Yu Yohan told me that uh, he had this tiny bedroom and in order to paint his Mao paintings, he had to move his bed out of, the, out of his room. Um, so that's, that's the dire situation that, that existed at the beginning of the 90s. And more important, there were no adequate critical tools, no art theory or analytical feedback, except among the artists themselves. The occasional foreign curator or collector often only voted with their feet. Chinese art critics were debating Chinese characteristics of a new Chinese national art. Most difficult of all, the Chinese government did not officially recognize contemporary art as art. So they had no place to go. The artists had no place to go to learn or to exhibit anything. Um, 1990, like you said, you said as well, 89 is really when the 90s started, with four, I think, really important and very symmetrical dates. On February 5, the exhibition China Avant-Garde opened in Beijing. Then, uh, the artists from all over China flocked to Beijing. I can't remember, 126, I think. Um, they had hired the exhibition spaces to show their installations, conceptual art, new paintings, and action art. And because of this incident with the pistol shot, that show was closed down and never reopened. And that was uh, almost like the beginning of the closing down of all of China after. Then in May, um, just a few months later, 1989, the exhibition Magicien de la Terre opened at the Centre Pompidou in Paris. The exhibition brought together art and artists from all over the world, marking the arrival of globalism in contemporary art. It also included installations by three Chinese artists, Hua Yongping, Yang Jiechang, and Gu Dexin, which caused a sensation in Western art circles. As a consequence, <coughs> Chinese art became an instant hype almost overnight, and that was in such an incredible contrast to what happened in China itself. And I think everything sort of goes from there, or the entire 90s can be characterized by these two sort of movements, one outside China, one inside. On, then on June 4, 1989, the Tiananmen, Man, Tiananmen Massacre marked the end of all democratization movements in China. And on November 9, of course, everybody knows, 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, marked the end of communism and the arrival of global capitalism in the West. And the funny thing is that by the end of the 90s, you see all these strands coming, to, coming together, global capitalism both in China and in the West, um, commercial, um, the art market, and so on, <coughs> everything sort of... But it's a miracle that that even happened within 10 years. It's absolutely incredible. 
After June 1989, there was an almost total blackout in the world of contemporary art in China. Many artists and art students had taken part in the demonstrations, which had happened all over the country. Many teachers did as well, often in the hope to prevent their students coming to harm. Many of them were questioned by the police, fired from the job or excluded from promotion. Some artists had to go into hiding for months. Some emigrated to Europe or the US or were granted political asylum. For almost two years, until the end of 1991, there were no shows to speak of of contemporary art anywhere in China. So from, from 1989 until the mid to late 90s, the development of Chinese contemporary art shows these two distinct currents, developments within China and those outside China. In the West, a Chinese hype was in the make. Following the Tiananmen, I'm, I'm sort of concentrating on the Western response to Chinese art because um, there have been so many misunderstandings. You have touched on them as well. Um, um, and I'm trying, going to try to make it a little bit clearer what happened, really, the, the, recep the reception of Chinese art in the West. Following the Tiananmen disaster, the demand for dissident Chinese art increased exponentially. This was soon joined by another demand. Chinese art had to have a Chinese look. Political pop and cynical realism, so Mao portraits and bitterly laughing Chinese faces, seemed to answer Western requests. By the end of the 90s, Chinese painting fetched some of the highest prices ever in contemporary art. Temptation among Chinese artists increased to commit auto-orientalism, to produce typical Chinese art according, but not according to Chinese artists, but according to Western taste. And because that demand was mainly created by the art market, this orientalism new style has acted, I think, very much to the detriment of a truly critical apprehension and, and appreciation of contemporary art within China, or of critical art within China, because this was like um, a brand criticism, if you will. So there was the dissident brand, there was the orientalist brand, um, and the pop art brand, and so on. And um, but the real idea art, the real individual art, the freedom of expression. All these things were disregarded largely by the West because it didn't, um, they didn't answer the ideas of what Chinese art was. Then there were the emigrated Chinese artists and critics. And they, they were trying to make what they were making, their works, comprehensible to a Western audience. Um, they needed to translate China for the West. In order to make a Western public understand their works, they not only had to make clear where their art came from, so the context, the Chinese context, and its relationship to uh, contemporary art in the West, but in doing so, the legitimate, their legitimate position within contemporary art, but in doing so, they again and again had to bridge the truly monumental cultural gaps in Western understanding of even the basics of Chinese art and history. In addition to this enormous job of cultural translation, they also worked tirelessly for the recognition of Chinese art in the West in order to get contemporary art accepted in China by the official uh, uh, authorities. And this has been an incredible job. Actually, the, the uh, Shanghai Biennial of 1998, which, which was a huge international success, has been very, very carefully prepared by Chen Zhen, the artist, and... Um, Hu Han Ru, the critic, um, even years before, because they could travel. They, had, they didn't have a political stigma attached to them. So they were negotiating with Chinese officials about how um, China could get sort of internationally known and, and, and become more um, accepted in the world, and that could be through art. So this, the, the 98 Pian Biennial was really so, some kind of a turning point, I feel, in... in um, uh, the acceptance also of contemporary art in China. When I visited China in 1996, I had a déjà vu, and this is about this is really about stopping painting or, or um, as a because in Western art history we have similar occurrences, like in uh, with Cubism and Futurism, 
um, this whole idea of taking out the part and putting it together again. And then in the, in the, in the 60s, or with Dada, for instance, it's not for nothing that the first action, the first happening in China was called Xiamen Dada by Huang Yiping. So, um, um, and I experienced something very similar in the 60s. Um, I had the incredible sensation um, that, wait a second here, somewhere, I had interviewed all these artists from the, from the 60s when I was an art critic, and m mostly people who had become very famous. And all of them, all these, these, these interviews I did started with the sentence, I gave up painting in 1961 or 1960. That was quite interesting. And had not there something very similar happened in China, I had the incredible sensation of being a witness to the birth of a true art, something you experience maybe once or twice in a lifetime if you get lucky. Here was an art that had been created because of the intelligence of the artists who had remained true to the necessity of independent thinking, to the necessity to reinvent art, to reconfigure it, its basic parameters, so that art, whether painting or otherwise, could again acquire moral validity in the face of Chinese modernity. To honor the existence of this kind of art, I decided I needed to make another long march. I want to go show you slides now. Still. Oh, this is actually Zhang um, Peili. This is a story in, in uh, a few years ago. I thought, why don't I put the same question I used to put to the artists from the 60s in, uh, from America and Europe? Um, but why did you stop painting? And they all said to me, painting was no longer adequate. And I decided to verify whether something similar um, had happened to artists in China. So I asked Zhang Peili why he had stopped painting. And he said, painting was no longer adequate for me. And this is the very first video which was ever made in, in video artwork in, in China, uh, 1991. It's called Washing a Chicken. And Zhang Peili, these are the artist's hands, he shampooed a chicken and put it in a basin with warm water. And the chicken is first flapping its wings and... Oh, sorry. I need to go the other way around. The, the, the chicken is first flapping its wings wildly and it doesn't... Um, uh, it doesn't want to, to, to be shampooed or in that basin because it's completely unnatural for a chicken to be shampooed. But gradually, while well, the artist is massaging the chicken and sort of stroking it and, and shampooing it and lathering it, and so, the chicken sort of gradually settles down in the basin. And sort of, at the end, it's completely in a trance. <laughs> and I thought this is so prophetic for what was going to happen in Chinese society with the new middle class. You know, they were all being massaged into settling down into, into this uh, luxurious kind of shampooing um, situation. This was um, the um, um, the this was the army barracks in army barracks, former army barracks in Breda, where the um, the show took place, and. Um, Actually, we had 19 artists there. They all came on tourist visa, and there was only one who lost his job, and that was Xu Tan, because they told him he could not go from his academy. He said, I'm going anyway. So they said, you're fired. He said, fine. So he came anyway. And uh, all the artists made site-specific works, and we had also earlier works whenever we could, whenever we could get them <coughs> sort of, because there was not that much money around either. But um, so Xu Tan arrived, I think the customs was something really funny because Xu Tan arrived with two enormous suitcases full of lunch boxes, empty lunch boxes, of a kind you cannot find in, in, in Holland. So light blue lunch, polyester lunch boxes. And um, the customs said, well, what are these lunch boxes for? And so Xu Tan gave them a lecture in Chinese, which they didn't understand, about contemporary art. He handed them an invitation, and they came to the opening. <laughs> so that, that's one of the, those are those very nice things that sometimes happen. Oh, sorry. This is, this is Lin Yilin 
from the Guangzhou um, Big Tail Elephant Group. Um, it's, it's a custom that, that uh, in, in important buildings you have these, these lines in, in front of the doors. And the right line, the right hand line is a male line, and the left, the left hand uh, line is a female line. And, and uh, Li Mielin made this, this work about new architecture, you know, this kind of building with this sort of um, power sort of architecture. And there, the, the male line is now fucking the female line. And he himself sat on the right hand pedestal um, uh, as a very old and, and powerless line in his pajamas. And then he was uh, driven around in his wheelchair uh, on the day of the opening, just to sort of <coughs> demonstrate that um, the old customs or the old ideas were not working anymore because everybody was fucking everybody on the other side of the pedestal. This is Gudeshin. It's the first time that he used fruit in his work. Um, Gudeshin is all about, um, I actually have to read that because I don't know it by heart, but um, he had like thousand kilos of apples and um, um, bananas and uh, strawberries displayed in the courtyard of the, of the army barracks. And people could come and eat but what they couldn't eat was left to rot. After a while, of course, it's not eatable anymore. So um, after some time, at the end of the exhibition, it looked, it looked like that. A lot of it had been eaten, but the whole thing is about rotting and decay. And um, this were the, some of the apples. And actually, um, here's another work by Gudishin, which is a small perspex um, between, with a small piece of meat in it. And he was going around for 10 days kneading the meat in his, between his fingers until it became a really nasty, gray, little, disgusting kind of object. And kneading this meat, and um, he's done that for a very long time. I'm going to read you what he said. What, why the meat and why? Um, um, when when Gudeshin stopped making out in ninety eight, in uh, sorry in two thousand and eight, just before the um, Olympics, because he thought um, that the Olympics were an absolute scandal, and. Um, um, and by, at that occasion, he said uh, why he always worked, why he worked with meat so much and rotting meat and so on. He said, we have been treated like meat. We have been grinded like meat. We have been passed through the mill and cut into a thousand pieces. That was more or less his farewell to art. Here's a close-up of the meat. This is Gudeshin in his studio, which is now has been recreated and is in the collection of the Ullens uh, family. But that studio was tiny and it was absolutely wonderful. This is Van Yushin, uh, who organized, I think, the, the, the exhibition, you, that was the New Generation exhibition, New Shorts, um, who was a, a journalist and a photographer. And um, this is a photo transparency which was hung in the in the um, in the canteen of the um, of the um, barracks, um, and they were photo transparencies of a famous event which had take, taken place during the Bosnian Serbian War, um, where the um, in Sarajevo, uh, where there was a beauty contest, and uh, the girls had put this banner, had carried this banner, "Don't let them kill us." And of course, this also refers to Tiananmen, it refers to China, it refers to all these situations where people are being um, killed. Um, this, this is again, or it's the other way around. And in front there's the, the, the menu with the um, films that we were showing as well. This is Mario Ming, I think I saw him there as well on the left side of the, the 
uh, performance video you showed. Um, this was a performance um, where everybody was asked to take off their shoes and he was rearranging the shoes. And um, he is here fun manuing, uh, manuing, which means that that was his uh, androgynous alter ego. He would make himself up so that you really couldn't, uh, when you looked at his face, you couldn't see whether he was a girl or, or, or a man. Um, but, um, so the very, this whole thing about sex in China is another, another subject that, that needs to be treated as well. Um, anyway, um, so he has the shoes and then you can sit with him and he dined up the shoes and then you can sit with him and be photographed. Um, this is uh, Feng Wen Bo, um, the first artist ever in China in 1996 to have made uh, internet um, uh, computer artwork. And it was called My Private Album. Actually, private albums have been f forbidden. You were not supposed to be an individual, so you were not supposed to have family uh, photographs and the family history and so on. Um, so all this whole, again, this is about identity. And um, here is, um, so you could go through the menu and see all these family photographs by, um, of Feng Wenfeng's family. This is Lin Tian Yao, trousers, with 10,000 needles, uh, Chinese needles in them, uh, paper trousers. And so it's a, it's a feminist work. Lin Tian Yao is a woman. And um, here is the detail of those trousers. Huge, I can't remember, maybe 25 meters long or something. This is another work by her, by Lin Chia where she asked uh, uh, women to, um, uh, to put cotton thread around, around an oak tree, you know, a branch of an oak tree, and she paid for the work as herself. So it's also a kind of um, feminist manifestation that women have to be paid, and that they have to be paid well. And she would do this in, in China with her own family. Um, here, here you are, <laughs> in 1996, in uh, uh, some in Lin Tian Miao and uh, Wang Wang Gongxing's uh, Hutong. This is a, another work by a woman, Chen Yan Yin. Um, the um, um, it's called ear testing. And it's an interrogation space, it's a, a, a replica of an interrogation space with soundproof material and a whispering voice asking the visitor, can you hear me? Do you understand me? What is your number? And you couldn't get out of the space unless you uh, banged on the door. So it was all about being completely claustrophobic and closed in and closed up. This is Chen uh, Shao of also of the Big Tail Elephant Group. Um, um, this is called Site Adjuster 4, also from 97. All these installations were site specific. Um, it's a voyeuristic video installation in the toilet. So there's a pinhole camera in the urinal, and you could see uh, you can see what happens up there on the little screen. And then there was a, a, the photo of a woman in, in the toilet that was not visible from outside where people could go and then, you know, uh, somebody, there was a camera there as well. So who knows what they did there, the men. It's all about the male toilets, of course. Another... Um, is that the end of the train? Yeah? I think it's the other way, maybe. Um, yeah. Here's a little thing installed in the urinal. Um, oh. I see. Mm -hmm. This is another work about sex. This is by Zutia, a photograph of a, of a performance he did in the streets where he would this is his hand holding a holding a, a bank account, how do you say it? A, a carton saying, did they have sex today? 
Mm -hmm. So and you couldn't talk, I mean, you couldn't even hold hands for a long time in public in China, let alone, you know, talk about sex or do anything like this. This is another work by him uh, called Forever, where he attached a, a video camera to the wheel of his bicycle and went through Beijing. This is uh, Li Yongbin. Um, again, this self-inspection and this idea of identity. This is his own face, so reflected in a bucket of ink, Chinese ink. And um, then he stirs the bucket, and the ink goes, and his face goes all um, um, weird and, and turns around very fast until it stops again. This is Kanjani. Um, it's a work called Who Is He? Um, and that was a work about, here you see a staircase. One day a man, Kanjani was warned that a man had come to see him. Uh, or I knocked at his door, but he didn't know who that man was. And so he made a work um, about uh, going around by the, at the neighbors and asking them, have you seen this man, and what was he like, and can you draw a picture of him? And um, the whole thing at that time, when he made it, it's 1994, uh, people were, were still supposed to tell on you, they were encouraged to tell on each other, and there were mailboxes where you could put um, little notes in saying this neighbor has done that and that and that at that time and the police should come and inspect them really. So um, this is very much a, a work about surveillance and about, um, uh, it's a very, I'm not going to say it's a paranoid work, but it's a general paranoia of that time for sure. And um, so um, this whole work refers to the possibility that he had been denounced by neighbors that someone from the secret police had come to see him. Uh, but also, the funny thing is that all these drawings, no one drawing is the same in this, in this work. All the, all the faces are different. Some say, yes, he had glasses, and the other said, yeah, he must be about 56 years old. And then there's someone else says, um, oh, there was a man of about 30. You know, so it's all also about the complete unreliability of witnesses and the harm that just gossip can do. So I think it's an absolutely brilliant work. This is another work by, by Ken um, It's a, um, It's Dutch floor samples, so the things you can, you can decorate your floors with. And actually it refers back to work that Ken did in China about the new middle class and the home decoration, which you also mentioned, um, and where the, where the Chinese new middle class has these fantastic sort of um, um, uh, decoration, wild decorations, but all of them, of course, are mass produced. They are so-called catering to individual taste and to you know distinguishing yourself from your neighbor, but actually, of course, they are just mass produced. So this is the Dutch uh, version, let's say, of those works that he made in China about home decoration. This is Gan Chen in his studio. This is Zhang uh, Peili, Zhou Tihai, and Gan Chen Yi, and me, Zhu 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 yeah. This is uh, another uh, Big Tail Elephant member, uh, Yang Zhihui, who died unfortunately mm, a few years ago because um, he, had, he had a heart thing and the, gov the, the hospital gave him one of these medicines that had been contaminated, tampered with, that were, that were bad. So he died from that. And I think he was one of, one of the geniuses, really, of, of contemporary Chinese art. This is, this is a, a work that reflects back on the, on the hutongs, on the destruction of the slums in the hutongs and the rebuilding of China. Um, so this is, uh, uh, it's built in, in a kind of cross, it has an entrance and an exit. 
And on the, on the outside of the walls, there's uh, like medical prescriptions for every kind of, promising to cure every kind of ill, and uh, illnesses and, and so on. And um, when you enter, it's all, it's all clad in a mirror. So this is the real cure, you know. The, it's 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 what what people dream of that everything is going to be this shiny new world. This is the Shutan. Um, it's a it's a um, a pun really on on the well known. Here are the lunch boxes that I put. The slide is old, so they're not like blue anymore. But um, this this is a, a pun on on this well known. Um, I dreamt I was a butterfly, did I dream the butterfly, or did the butterfly dream me? So, uh, not his power, power is the same. Um, and so he has, he has painted these organs on his face. But actually, Chutan, before he started making installations and so on, he was also painting. He was painting Rembrandt and Soutine, these huge carcasses, he was, he was really gripped by that, by this, these carcasses of beef that Rembrandt painted and Soutine painted. And so he thought there's no beef available in the market in, in China, but there's pigs. So he started painting pigs, you know, carcasses, pig carcasses. So this is from how the pig carcasses evolved. And um, there's organ transplants and all sorts of... Mm. <coughs> this is Wang Zhongwei, who is always, like Karen also said, being um, not obsessed, maybe obsessed, uh, with systems and circulation. This is a barter work. It's it's an exchange economy. Uh, he put these plastic ears um, for all sorts, brown, yellow, and pink, for the three race, human races. Um, there was no red ears available, I think. Uh, and then the public could go and take an ear, and it would, if you squeeze the ear, it sort of said, beep, beep, and the public could go and take an ear and then they had to put something of themselves in there, in the, in the right-hand box. And when you saw the junk that put, people were putting in there, it was sort of... It made me very sad because it was... Some people were really nice. They had a... Um, there was a little girl who had, a, who had, I don't know, something special, something personal. But sometimes it was just, you know, um, old um, handkerchiefs or something. Um, but at, at the end of the show, the right-hand box with the stuff that the people had put into there was to be shipped back to Beijing, and that was a separate became then a separate artwork. This is another work, but Wang uh, Wei has been spent a long time, very miserable time in, at the military, reading Hegel in the toilet, and um, and he was a map maker uh, there. And so, because this had been barracks, he, he, uh, he wrote a script about uh, uh, the story of, a, of a, uh, um, a Chinese soldier, but as if he had been Dutch. Unfortunately, the script has never been published. It was, it was quite a beautiful story. And um, so this was the waiting room uh, where you were supposed to wait until you were um, called in uh, whether you wanted to become a soldier or not. And this is his face upon the way, with uh, painted white, as if he were a Dutch soldier, but telling his own stories from the Chinese military. This is Wang Zhongwei in his studio, where you see the same glass bottles and, and things. This is Zhou uh, Tiahai. Uh, this is a partly Chinese revolution, partly French revolution. Again, this combination of Western and Eastern um, iconography. And here I have the same slide with the Vuitton. Actually, that, that painting doesn't exist anymore, that drawing. It's terrible. It burned in John uh, in Pierre Hebert's uh, um, um, storage space. So that doesn't, that's gone. This is also Tokyo Hyde. It's a bugle call. Um, he had a bugle. He had this megaphone installed on top of the um, uh, on top of the roofs, um, in the Chinese Chinese bugle calls every morning, midday, afternoon, and before before you went off duty. So that was pretty 
pretty harassing actually, this megaphone, this megaphone blaring all the time. And this is also Zotjahar, I'm sorry, I think it's, it's called Will. Um, and it's a work about censorship. Um, it's a video installation in, in uh, an auditorium. Actually, this was not an auditorium, we just put the chairs there. Um, the, the monitor shows black film only, with uh, only the first and the last titles. And the first is Will, and the last is Goodbye Art. Um, there was no, this is a work that he made because he wanted to make a film, he had the script, he had everything, but there was no possibility to make a film for him because the Chinese government, everyone who made a film, video, or otherwise, had to pay 500,000 RMB, which amounts to 50,000 euro or dollars, which is an absolute, nobody could pay that. Um, and then Shiseido in Japan, where, where um, uh, Chihai had a, had a show offered to produce the film for him, and even then he couldn't do it because the um, there was no possibility that the Chinese artists could make a film out of <coughs> China and show it only in foreign countries. That was also forbidden. So this is um, and this is the last work of the show. Thank you very much, Mariana. So we are uh, thanks of the non translate uh, non consecutive translation. We are in time. <laughs> That's great. That's good. And um, before I give the word to the public, I would like to just to make one, one remark or question to you, because I, I think it's very important to, to, to say that, the, for example, that what is called political pop, for example. There was one more slide. Yeah. <laughs> Hans. Hans, yeah. Yeah. And Hans van Dijk. Hans van Dijk. Yeah. And in the project, all yeah. that to, to your show. Yeah, okay, we, we let this say, yeah. we come back to that. Yeah. Uh, I just want to ask, because the, when Hans and me went to China in 1991 to look for artists and for works for the show 1993, we were very surprised what we found. When we went to Family Dune, for example, the guy who was yeah. painting the, 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 the people with the uh, hair and the things, it was, was a new mo movement. It was like a new movement, a new generation, which opposed the older generation, the idealistic generation of the 80s, or of the 85 movement. Yes. So it was not, like, like we, cannot, we cannot say it's a, a, an action of the West, and then they painted like this, but it was, it had been painted, and Hans and we were shocked first, because really? we said, oh, do, do they go back to the socialist realism now? Or what, what do they do? Or do they say no future now? Or what happens? Yeah? And then, when we showed it here in 93, we could not deny it. We could not say we show uh, contemporary Chinese art and leave that out. What happened between ninety and ninety ninety three? So it, we showed part of it and showed the development of the younger generation yeah. too. But then the press, the Western press, they yeah. really jumped, jumped on it. Exactly. Jumped on it. Yeah. yeah, you saw every also the New yeah. York Times. They choose Fang Jin on yeah. the cover. And or, or everything. So it's more because the other things are much more complicated, like yeah. Antony's form or or like the videos of Chan yeah. Fadi. It was not so that easy. Yeah. Yeah. Just to say that it's not only the, 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 the action and the demand from the West no, and no, then they produce. No, yeah. sorry, that's what yeah. I did that's not what I meant. Yeah, actually. Okay. Certainly okay. Not. It's just no. to, to make no, this clear. To, yeah. Later later no, there right. were several people yeah. to, who were a little bit on demand. Yeah. yeah. That, uh, but never mind. But no okay. there, there was an original of course. Um. All right. If if you agree, if you agree, um, if you have uh, wanted to first, or shall we just open that, that there are some voices, some questions, some remarks? Would you agree with it, Karen? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so we please uh, just. Uh, it's your turn to to ask them to. <laughs> 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 
no, no remark, no, no comment, or no. Just over. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, for me, I would, I, I'm a bit at loss what Mrs. Browers actually wanted to show us. I mean, we saw a lot of pictures from Bader, but I mean, I, I didn't get the point. So, sorry. Um, Maybe I got lost for, by, by all the images. So, what was your what is your basic insight or statement? My basic idea in doing that show was that this was, there was a, um, painting in the West had gotten so much attention, Chinese painting, and the quest for dissident art and so on. And um, I was convinced that the more interesting stuff was this stuff. It was, the, it was the installations, it was the video. And because it responded so immediately and so uh, uh, aptly to what was going on in China. Uh, um, and it was also very clear um, that Certain things were derived, were, were coming from um, from the refusal of ink painting, for instance. Like Chichi Jia is a fantastic ink painter, and um, his first performances was about abandoning ink painting. Um, so, I've always thought that um, two things: one was to sort of redress the balance in Western appreciation a little bit of Chinese art. Uh, and say, no, this, the whole idea of, of just the art market was getting into place more and more. And, um, and this, this kind of work was really being overlooked, largely. So, so am I correct that you are uh, making a difference between dissident art and art art? No, 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 not at all. No, there was this, there was this demand. Yes. Um, and nobody really in the West had any any idea what dissident art actually was like. I mean, it was it was styled after what people knew about Russia. Um, but in fact, in in Russia, you had in in the in the, the, the samizdat and so on. And people always wanted to know how much people had suffered because they made art. And this kind of voyeurism was also going on about China, in the West. And uh, I mean. There is a difference between really good art critics and, uh, and, and journalists and so on. But in general, that has been going on in the appreciation of Chinese art. That's mm -hmm. what I want, mm -hmm. basically. It took me a long time to Thank formulate. You. Sorry, <laughs> but yeah. That's your... Um, well, <coughs> one of the issues was that for a very long time there wasn't really an audience. Um, it wasn't easy for people to to see those things because unless you were a friend of the artist, you know, everything took place very much within circles of friends. And a lot of the, um, even though a space might be affiliated with something like the Central Academy of Fine Arts, it still didn't mean that it was a public space in the way that you understand a public space or, you know, there, there wasn't the media to promote exhibitions that were taking place either. It wasn't really something that was um, publicised very widely. Um, you probably noticed that the the one uh, announcement of the exhibition I said that Hans van Dijk did by Wang Xinwei was in a magazine. That was kind of, um, I think there's always been these English language magazines that are published free. Um, but you know, amongst the Chinese audience, no real way, and it's still one of the biggest problems today, because um, there's a lot, you know, there's an increasing interest in culture, but there's still not very much focus on developing local audiences. So, uh, for the longest time, one of the biggest problems with the 90s was the fact that artists were only making art for other artists. They weren't even thinking about audiences. Um, and that was a bit of a problem, because then it became a little bit too self-reflecting um, or, you know, yeah, so. Yeah, I have a question regarding this. I would like to know, um, because you both are from Western countries, and is there also like um, 
Chinese art critics or art historians talking about these topics in the same from the same kind of view, or is it like more a Western view on Chinese art? Like, is this? Do you mean? Is, I, I don't think my view is a very Western view on Chinese art because I think a lot of the a lot of the way that I would describe how things happened in the 1990s is very much from a Chinese perspective. And in fact, I've been criticised before for that because sometimes it's sort of, um, I, I, you know, I said earlier, I'm trying to work on this book about the 1990s, and one of the most difficult things about it is actually to write it in a, if you're writing in English, in a way that a lot of the issues, and it, a lot of the patriotism and a lot of the issues that sort of, you know, were seen as being odd responses to things that were happening were very much due to what was being propagated about this kind of, you know, still going back to Mao saying we have to overtake, you know, Britain, we're going to catch up with America. It was always about beating and, or catching up with the West and doing it better, learning more, um, turning it to the Chinese way and then triumphing you know, over adversity. And I think that the 2000s, you know, was suddenly a very clean break. It was like you could put everything behind you. Um, but I still think that sort of how people addressed issues was still coming out of this period of sort of feeling not confident in the local culture, whereas today I think there's a, there's a confidence that is particularly noticeable between young, um, young people in China who speak English, they have a worldly knowledge, um, maybe through the internet, but they travel more, their education system has changed. They can read more, you know, books, you know, and, and their whole world outlook is very, very different to the generations that were kind of like coming to art in the 80s and the early 90s. Yeah. But still, I did notice that um, Gao Mingdu, for instance, never ever mentions um, uh, China avant garde here in Berlin. Or, um, I mean, what? what shows by Chinese artists in outside China did for Chinese art was huge. Mm. But somehow, some, some, I notice that some Chinese art critics have a tendency to not mention these shows. Why do they hate C? <laughs> Why do they hate Uri C? That's one thing I never understand. Who, you know, who, who hates Uri C? Many, many Chinese artists. You know? Because they didn't pay for me. Huh? He didn't take problems. He didn't take problems, no. He's a Swiss. He's one of the most important collectors of Chinese art. Many, many of the works didn't exist anymore. He yeah. hadn't collected them. So he's really the one who made uh, one of the most important persons to... And he started early. Yeah, and he started Yeah, early. but he went into the studios very early and he paid very little. And then now then, of course, that's where it's like... That's what it's <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's like, no, uh, no, Sik took, uh, took advantage out of his position, which many, many uh, uh, diplomatic persons did at that time. I know some other uh, diplomatic persons from the French embassy, from the Swiss right. embassy, Li Shan, or, or these people, very cheap, and really the whole work. So this guy had no chance afterwards. Yeah, but so we, we can criticize that for sure. This is clear, but but it's not the topic today. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but uh, I say this uh, end of story is last year. There's a ten uh, big scandal from China uh, art circle. One is the uh, Uli Zik uh, action, which he donation his work to Hong Kong Art Museum. Mm -hmm. Also, put among the work to sell to the government of Hong Kong. So this big scandal in China. So it's the reason to mm. that they, they don't like him. I think it is no. for general for public, not only for individual Chinese artists. Mm -hmm. So this is a big argument. Uh, end of this year and uh, last year. You both made pretty clear that in a way how contemporary Chinese artists react and reflect the society and the political framework conditions in their country. My question goes in a different direction. Can you tell us a bit more about the impact of contemporary art in China or to the development of the uh, Chinese uh, society? Mm -hmm. I always found it very, very difficult to see any impact 
of Chinese culture for Iran. I think you're right. Um, but that goes for Europe as well as for America as well. I mean, art is not really out there on the streets or really being paid attention to by the masses. In the history. Yeah, of course, of course. Of course. But, I mean, the general public. Um, Generally, it's, it's uh, great. Well, I think one of the things that, uh, you know, if you look back to the, uh, the period under Mao, you know, actually they had a national art exhibition that would take place every five years. And that was really the first time that uh, people were exposed to art, you know, on a real regular basis. And, it, you know, what's interesting today is that there's just opened a museum in Shanghai called the, the Long Museum. And the collector has a, a very uh, broad array of works from the kind of propaganda era. And uh, having been to the museum a couple of times, you know, it's always fascinating to watch the local people who go in there because um, the collection is divided between a classical part uh, um, and then a 20th century modernism and contemporary part. And then it's got this like social realism section. <coughs> and every Chinese visitor who goes there knows every single one of the paintings from the, the, like, the red revolutionary era. And they have stories about them, you know, because a lot of these pictures were created for particular events to commemorate particular moments. And so they would circulate as posters and they would circulate everywhere. So there was, you know, that, that period of people being exposed to art is actually quite unusual in the, in the breadth, you know, as a, as a visual reference, as a visual language that people saw. Because prior to that, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, uh, culture was something that happened within very refined circles, you know, like literati circles. And I think that's sort of a little bit the way it happens today, because, you know, they're, they're struggling to build, there's lots of museums, but to build a real public institution is still, you know, it's quite a long way off. So, none of the new museums that are being built are going to be in a position to have a real proper collection, I don't think, because the prices are just too high, and there's not really the enough, the trained kind of staff who would know how to put together a collection that would be suited to, I mean, it's very d difficult to imagine something, you know, like even if you have the Pompidou or Tate, you know, to start collecting now, if you were to put together, it would be very difficult. So in that sense, you know, where people will see art, how they'll see it, and what they'll see of it in the future is, is kind of an interesting issue in China. But having said that, since they've opened a new, um, uh, what do you call the National the History Museum in Beijing? I mean, you get a tremendous number of people going. And when the, even the opening of the Shanghai Biennale last year in September, which took place on the October holiday, which normally is a very important holiday for Chinese people, but there was huge numbers of ordinary people. I mean, for me, that was the most exciting thing about that Biennale, was just the great volume of local people who made it a family day out to go and see the Shanghai Biennale. So. Oh, the awareness yeah. also of, of contemporary art has really grown because there's lots more collectors. There were no collectors, Chinese collectors, uh, back in the 90s, but now there are. So there's a growing amount of people who have a real interest in, in the fact that contemporary art exists and that you can hang it in museums and people go to see it. Like the Zendo Museum is a private museum, um, but they do huge shows and there's always, and they make very sure. The Zander Museum. It's now called the Himalaya Museum in, in Shanghai. They always make sure that they have um, local people in, and that they, they try to do a program for local people. You know, the people who go shopping there, who live around, who live around um, in Budong, in that area. So they do try. Some of them. Do you consider this kind of uh, collecting or new collectors? As on the first side to uh, an impact of contemporary art to the development of the, uh, of the society as a whole? Oof, that's difficult to answer. But, I mean, if, if, you could, if you were to ask, um, I don't know, I think, I think um, when these big museums, like, like the Himalaya Museum, which is based on the private collection, uh, which is ancient art, by the way, not contemporary, but now there's contemporary art being added to it. Um, I feel 
that this is an endeavor by someone who these things are going to be more and more established, I'm sure. And you can answer, I mean, you, you know far better you're being, you're being a museum director mm -hmm. these days. Yeah. So, Embedded, yes, that's right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think the problem is, you know, I, I left England in 1988, and I don't think we had contemporary art in England in 88, but we had lots of museums, and we had some great galleries, and art was something that I grew up, museums were something we grew up with. You know, it was just so normal to spend weekends in museums. Um, and I think that the problem with contemporary art, and it's not just in China, is how it's become just a kind of a, you know, it's, it's sort of such a fashion thing in many ways. And it's, it's just how it's shown is then sort of, it's dictated in a certain way. And if it really does, you know, relate to what's happening around us, and if, you know, if you do believe, as I do, you know, that good art really should be able to tell us something about, you know, the times we're living in, then how it's shown is critical to, to how it's read. Um, and I think that the way that contemporary art is shown in China outside of those shows that are curated by people who know, so therefore the Shanghai Biennale was a very, you know, it was an okay example. But interestingly enough, it was a really great Biennale for, for ideas. You know, you walked out thinking a hundred thoughts, but you probably couldn't remember any of the artworks in there. Um, and that, that energy doesn't always appear in many of the exhibitions that you see. And I think that there just really needs to be, somehow with the classical art, it's that, you know, there's more knowledge out there, there's more resources that people can tap into. But I think with the contemporary, it's difficult to know how much that will really um, build a profile, unless you've got some people who really start, you know, trying to do some proper sort of research and, you know, putting more things out there. Would you think it has developed one special Chinese characteristic? I mean, it's really that this um, young Chinese art has become a business very fast. I mean, this kind of, um, I, I, I buy art for yeah. being able to bring it to the next auction house. I mean, this is something really very different from, from at least what I know from, from Europe or America. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are more people involved in, in doing this, and, and it's so Chinese in a way. But, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I mean, that's kind of a, a social mechanism, perhaps. I, I, I think if you actually want to look at the art, it's, you know, it's like, I don't think you'd be able to look at the art in any particular country and say there's, there's one characteristic in it. You know, I, I see, you know, a lot of the most interesting stuff um, is, is made in an incredibly complex way, but looks really simple. But you know, that's another story. I mean, you'd have to see images to kind of work out that. But I mean, that there seems to be uh, a trend in that mode. But I think that it's partly because of the way art's taught. It's such a, a complete system so that when people leave art school, they, they're given the entire tools and references as to how you make paintings. Um, and so in order to break away from that, people have to go pretty long lengths to, to find new ways to to, you know, it, it come up with an individual style. But I don't think there's a, you know, there's a real characteristic that's just Chinese. Um. I think this, this art market uh, phenomena has really grown and so on. And, I mean, we've known that for a long time in the West, really. It's, it's been a, a, a story, as far as I can remember, ever since the 50s. And before that, of course, also. And I mean, the, the hype that was around Van Gogh when Van Gogh sold for 70 or 80 million dollars um, suddenly made everybody think, um, oh, art is hot and we have, to, you know, that, that sort of brought a whole commercial wave behind it. And, um, and everybody was focused on anything but the art. It was all about the high prices. So, I mean, we, we, we have done the same thing in the West that is being done in China. And auction houses are exactly the same. And whether it's, you know, Dutch old masters or whether it's Chinese um, 
I think it's all it's all about this. Um, the, the problem is that it gets in the way of looking at it and really thinking about it because it's all about cash and carry and speculation. I, but I think I want to add something because I, I don't know if you saw the first presentation of our talks of uh, uh, a presentation of his cultural art theory because I think education here is really central and it's really a lot of Chinese artists are looking forward to go to create new public spaces for like not gallery or institutions, institution spaces but where it's possible to get in contact with a number of people. Like there are initiatives in Shanghai, in Trout, where they make for one year, every year, uh, an, uh, an art event in the public space in the, inside the city, um, which was created by Viviana Chiric, who will come in April here. And also Chang Mopu, the artist, which will also come in, in April. He has this initiative on the, on the countryside, or, Wu Guang Guang, another artist, is a documentary film and he's going to the village side and is documenting, and I mean he gives the film cameras to the, uh, the farmer are documenting their own life. So there are a lot of long art projects, there are a lot of initiatives from artists themselves to create new um, spaces. Yeah. That's true. That will be, we will cover also these grassroots things in, in autumn. There will be another discussion with people who do this. There's, there's one thing perhaps we ought to mention that is the changing of habits of seeing in, within the society. It's, we yeah. have the market, which is very much money driven and uh, made basically the Western, driven, Western market driven. You have the artist world. And you have this the, the, the change of, of seeing habits of, uh, which yes. is transported by industrial design. And you have in, 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 in the, the big hotels in, in Beijing, you have the critical, cynical uh, realism pictures hanging. So it's the new middle classes. Yeah. They are adapting it. And they're adapting it perhaps on a not very high philosophical, theoretical level, but they are, they, they are the basis that Things are open. When I was teaching in China, we, I used to make a, every year with my students a show about showing them modern pictures. And the most, the, the first year, in 1781, they just say, no, it's not art, no art. Second year, they try, started accepting impressionism. Third year, it was uh, expressionism. And then, all at once, abstract was no, no longer a problem. It changed from year to year. And this process is going on, of course. Uh, that uh, society is opening to modern uh, views of things. This is, and then on top, of, of course, you have the reflection that is going to be avant-garde, if you want. Uh, you know, uh, that, that is feeding back into the society. I think you have to consider it in the whole context of social change in China. Exactly, and it's so fast. We have to really to, to make yeah. to realize that it's so yeah. fast, much faster than it had ever been here. So it's it's also difficult, and there's so many many. Also, the the, the, the contrary between the countryside and and yeah. cities, it's it's much more than between our cities and their cities. Shanghai and and, and, and Berlin uh, could get along very well, but not uh, uh, Shanghai and the uh, San Wenzhou, uh, uh, villages. So you have these rural areas, which have another idea about art, uh, absolutely, and, and this is really a big change. And on the other hand, you have what, what you said before, mentioned before, there are also very responsible museum directors who really are able to bring really interesting programs to the public and bring also school classes. I, I saw in the Minchun Art Museum, with a fantastic video exhibition which covered 1988, Champelli, until 2011. School classes there, and they were guided, guided tours through the video and, and not uh, and, and in, a, in a very liberal way. And I think this is one chance, or the other chance is like Chu the teaching of teaching methods of Chen Xiaopeng 
in, in, in Kanto and Guangzhou, you have also other teachers at the academy who really try to, 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 to open the eyes in another way, not in the Western way, and not in the, the, the old Chinese way, but in a <coughs> new way, maybe also for us very new, but very great. And I think this is uh, but only a little past that, that is clear. Um, I hope my English is not making me. German is slightly better than before. Um, quick, quick uh, following up of um, a few feedback from audience and putting together the earlier assumption that uh, uh, Mrs. Brower actually put the, um, the keynote uh, to say actually Chinese painters or Chinese artists are giving up paintings. Um, and I'm slightly cautious in that because I'm actually from Nanjing and I studied exactly in the same school that Li Xiaoshan, yeah. who wrote that article, mm -hmm. who declared that um, we've got to be very careful. If we continue to work this way, then Chinese ink painting and Chinese ink painting actually, he particularly say landscape paintings, are not really have way out in con contemporary time. Um, There are certain things I think need attention a little bit. It's not um, not this part. It's the art in China has always been very historical. So several questions talk about why it's like that in the 90s. So we might really have to go back to 80s and have to go back to 70s and to think about actually the uh, circumstances what was happening in the mid 1980s was really a response to the very extreme situation during the um, 10 years Cultural Revolution. And there was actually a very interesting period of time before Cultural Revolution, but after 1949, it was actually quite interesting the activities we currently in the historical writing had not really go back to that period of time, which is starting from 1953 up to 1963, sometime around that. Um, and also, I would be very careful, uh, be careful to say that Chinese artists are giving up paintings, which is actually really not the case. Um, it's really the artists that we, like, we, we started to pay close attention to, who happened to find a new medium, that they were inspired uh, by the very active um, transform, um, 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 the transfer of knowledge. Um, so the first, very active? Uh, the very active transfer of knowledge. Um, at the very first five to six years after the, um, the, the Cultural Revolution. So that was actually the response to that. So there were certain very small group of artists that start to try new medium, where parallelly there are still millions and millions of artists. They either work as a professional artist, or majority of them are actually not working as a professional. They have their own profession, but they actually really at home. So I don't want to go back to the feedback from the director said um, you know, the impact of art. Um, if I may just simply put, um, the Chinese artists, if we consider that in the context, to have uh, make the art kind of useful um, to do something, to make impact in society, might not really always be the departure of the art. So that's I really come from the tradition of literary painting. And then the uh, second reason is was really because of cultural revolution. Art was all about making impact and being used and being spoken by the political purpose. Um, so that's why even you know, after the cultural revolution, we do see many artists are really still trying things without needing to turn themselves as socialist activists, which we actually see here. Um, more regularly than artists do. Some of them do pick up this social roles in their uh, practices. And a third point I would like to make, the artists be patient, because the artists we're talking here are really still young artists. Um, and then they started by discovering new medium and trying it in the 80s and started blossoming in 90s and then in the 21st century started to have international attention. But talk about the artists, they're still young, they're maybe just a knock at the door. Just a knock at the door, just be patient and stay go and just keep trying. Maybe one quick.
say also that uh, uh, painting just, just stopped for a special group of p people, mm. and for the others there, there were a lot of painting. And painting officially, I also would like to tell uh, or to say that that in the end of the 90s, painting came back officially also in a very interesting way. We had uh, really great paintings in the in the end again, oh, yeah. together with That's photography, photography, and, and in the beginning of 2000. Uh, you have the young Liu Wei and others uh, who are really, again, work with the painting. So painting is also sometimes out, sometimes then it comes again. And, uh, uh, except uh, except what, far, far away from the, from the market. But I, I, I would say the there is a reconfiguring. I'm not, I didn't say that everybody was giving up painting. Because people still paint all the time, because they are all very good at it. But, the, the painting itself, the whole notion of the painting, what it was, why it exists, and so on, that has been questioned. And uh, actually, there was a, a very beautiful article by Fei Dawei about um, ink paintings, um, and more specifically calligraphy, in, um, which said that um, it went back to the, I think, 12th century or something. Here, here I'm not a sinologist. Um, um, about the habit, no, there was there was a group of apparently of calligraphers who made paintings with fire, with water, with straw, with and so on. And to fade away as a top Chinese critic who was also organized part of the um, uh, China avant-garde show, to him. Um, what happens in Chinese art is giving up painting or stopping painting or transforming painting. That's maybe what what it, what, what should say. It was all about this freedom um, that these 13th century or so um, uh, calligraphers had, and he said that basically the same thing is happening now again because they ask themselves why this freedom of using any kind of material to make art. That is what it's about. It's not about whether you stop painting. You can do the same thing while you paint, except the painting will look very different. It's not about having a brush and, and oil or ink or whatever. It, it will be reconfigured. It will be deconstructed and put together again. That is what I meant with what happened. Thank you both for being here. Have you here?